Hello, this is Meteorology 113, Lecture 4, Ambient Air Pollution, Part 1. This is the first lecture of Course Module 2, Outdoor Air Pollution. The outline of this lecture is as follows. We will first formally define air pollution. This is important to frame the topic for better understanding of how air pollution is typically viewed, studied, and regulated in the professional community. In doing this, we will define the term ambient air pollution. We will then cover how health effects occur as a result of the combination of the concentration and duration of air pollution exposure. This will introduce the topic of acute versus chronic health effects, long versus short-term exposure, and levels of concern for concentrations, which depend on exposure time. Levels of concern are concentrations beyond which health effects can be anticipated. The topic of air pollution regulation will then proceed on the next lecture. Ambient air pollution definitions. To provide context, we first revisit some slides from Lecture 3. Shown here is a visual of the nitrogen cycle through the Earth's system. If you recall, a main nitrogen-related air pollutant is NOx, or oxides of nitrogen. Nitrogen dioxide is the main component of NOx that directly impacts human health. One of the points made in this slide is the distinction between natural and anthropogenic sources of NOx. In the case of NOx, lightning is a natural source, whereas combustion from automobiles and stationary factory equipment, such as smokestacks and industrial equipment within a facility, are an anthropogenic source of NOx. In the case of lightning, NOx is created by the intense heating of an air column within the lightning beam, which converts a small portion of N2 and O2 in the air to NOx. Fuel combustion within the units of industrial sources and within the engines of mobile sources are an example of an anthropogenic source. Similar to lightning, the intense heat of combustion through chemical reactions converts a portion of the N2 and O2 in the combustion air into NOx. Also in Lecture 3, we presented a visual of the sulfur cycle through the Earth's system. If you recall, a main sulfur-related air pollutant is sulfur dioxide, or SO2. Volcanoes are a natural source of SO2 to the atmosphere, ejecting large plumes from sulfur in the Earth into the atmosphere in the form of SO2. SO2 from coal combustion plants, on the other hand, are, a, are an anthropogenic source. We then emphasize the concentration levels of these species that on average exist around the globe due just to natural sources. We call this the natural background concentration. Notice that these concentrations are small, but non-zero. For NO2, this typically ranges from 0.2 to 5 ppb. For SO2, natural background concentrations are usually less than 1 ppb. So with this lead-up, we can define air pollution. There are several variations, however, the following succinctly covers the main aspects. Reading here, air pollution is the buildup of naturally or anthropogenically emitted gases and or particles in air concentrations sufficiently high to cause or produce excessive risk of damage to human health, plants, animals, other life forms, ecosystems, structures, or works of arts. Unpacking this definition, the key parts are first 
that air pollution includes both natural and anthropogenic emission sources. Wildfire smoke impacts on population, for example, would be a natural emission source of smoke or particulate air pollution, whereas the exhaust from diesel trucks, which are large um, sources of diesel particulate, would be an anthropogenic source. We saw examples of natural and anthropogenic sources of SO2 and NOx on previous slides. Second, the clause sufficiently high or excessive risk of implies a level of concern or threshold above which risks of he the human health would begin to exist and below which are negligible. We will cover the concept of levels of, concern, of, levels of concern more in depth in later slides. Finally, while the um, forms that damage can take span very different forms, we focus on, in this class on the human health risks of air pollution, not so much focusing on these other things. The focus of most air pollution regulation is on what is termed ambient air pollution, or in other words, air pollution in the ambient air. This can be visualized in this photograph overlooking San Jose on a summer day. One sees a blanket of haze, brownish polluted air, spanning the city. Being so spatially broad, the general population of the city is therefore exposed to the polluted air, regardless of the specific address or neighborhood. This is ambient air pollution. Air pollution that spans an entire region due to emissions spread over the area. This is instead of air pollution emitted from a specific, very close local source, which affects just those close by. For example, if one lives on a busy road with lots of trucks going by. Also, ambient air is outdoor air, and therefore indoor air pollution is not included. Here is another visual of ambient air pollution, this time the urban air pollution haze so common to Los Angeles. Ambient air pollution, concentration, duration, and health effects. Returning to the definition of air pollution, we can recall the three main parts. The first and third are fairly clear, that both natural and anthropogenic emission sources can cause air pollution, and that the damaging or potentially damaging effects of air pollution can take many forms. As we mentioned, this class is, fo is mostly focused on human health. The second point, on the other hand, requires further explanation, that concentration levels must be high enough to be or present an excessive risk of being damaging. This implies what is called in the air pollution world a level of concern or threshold above which adverse health effects can be anticipated and below which such effects may not be anticipated. Of course, there is not a unique single level of concern that applies across the board to the population, since individuals have varying levels of susceptibilities to adverse effects of environmental exposure to contaminants. For this reason, Levels of concern are generally set to apply to portions of the population that are most susceptible or sensitive, for example, the elderly or children. We will now examine this topic further. The adverse effects of environmental exposure are often divided into two classes, acute and chronic. The next two slides will clarify the difference. On the graph on the inset, we illustrate a generic time trend of contaminant concentration an, in, an individual or an ex, a population may be exposed to. The vertical axis is the concentration level increasing upwards. And the horizontal is time, elapsing further in time going right across the axis. 
we first focus on acute health effects. Acute health effects and exposure are due to short-term exposure. For example, for an air pollution, this can be a single hour, day, or several days, for example. An example could be the exposure to air pollution during a particular day or days when air pollution concentrations are high. For example, the high concentrations of smoke in the air during the major wildfire episode of November 2018. Acute health effects are illustrated on the graph as the short duration of relatively high concentration near the left part of the graph. Also indicated is a, by the dashed line is the level of concern for short-term exposure to this con contaminant. The period of time when concentrations exceed this le level of concern for short-term acute effects are therefore when acute health effects may be anticipated for sensitive individuals. Other times when concentrations are lower than this level of concern are those when such effects may not be anticipated. Levels of concern are determined by health effects research and continue to be more accurate and comprehensive as our scientific understanding of health effects for contaminants advances. With this lead up, we can now make some explicit points about acute health effects and exposure. First, acute health effects are due to short term exposure generally less than one day in duration of an unhealthy concentration level to an air pollutant. This causes short-term health effects. Examples are lung and throat irritation, asthma exacerbation, episodic respiratory symptoms, hospitalizations, or even death if concentrations are very high. Examples of events that lead to acute health um, air pollution problems are bad air pollution days or events, major wildfires, or industrial accidents that happen rarely, but do occur. This uh, applies a level of concern or threshold for short-term acute effects above which concentration levels would have to exceed before such effects begin to occur. That's illustrated here by the dashed line and the period of time when acute, eff acute effects may occur are those when the red line exceeds the black dashed line for levels of concern for short-term effects. We now focus on chronic health effects. Chronic health effects, on the other hand, are due to exposure to long-term um, air pollution. For air pollution, this is generally regarded as multi-year to lifetime exposure to a concentration level. An example could be the exposure to poor air quality in the city you have lived most of your life. It is important to note that concentration in this case applies to average levels over a long period not focusing on the day-to-day -day ups and downs in concentrations. This is illustrated on the graph by the purple line, which indicates the average concentration over period of time shown on by the entire graph on the horizontal axis. Some of the time during this period, concentrations are higher than the purple line, while others, concentrations are lower. Yet on average, the purple line indicates the exposure averaged over the entire time period. The dashed line indicated here is the level of concern for short long-term exposure to this contaminant. As seen, the average concentration indicated by the purple line exceeds this level of concern for long-term chronic health effects. And therefore, in the example on this slide, chronic health effects may be anticipated for in sensitive individuals due to the exposure on average to the concentrations indicated by the red line. With this lead up, we can now make some explicit points about chronic health effects and exposure. First, long-term or annual the lifetime exposure of an unhealthy amount of air pollution leads to long-term, the possibility of long-term chronic health effects. Examples of such health effects are respiratory and cardiovascular disease, cancer, or increased 
um, risk of premature mortality as a result of these things. This is due to exposure to long-term average concentrations above a level of concern suitable for long-term average concentrations and chronic health effects. Examples of situations that are pose an excessive risk to chronic long-term effects, health effects due to air pollution are living in a very polluted city or area for a long period of time or lifetime exposure in a workplace to bad air. We can illustrate these points by example for common air pollutants. Here we show the depiction for sulfur dioxide. The horizontal axis is the concentration of sulfur dioxide in parts per million, ranging from 0.01 ppm to 10 ppm. The vertical axis is exposure time, ranging from 3 seconds to 10 years. We indicate three areas within the body of the graph. The light blue area is where the paired concentration and exposure durations are such that adverse health effects are not anticipated. Notice that this area corresponds to lower concentrations and shorter exposure times, as we would expect. The light blue hatched area is where paired concentration and exposure times increase to the point where adverse health effects begin to occur. These effects range from short-term acute effects, such as increased airway resistance, which would trigger difficulty or pain when breathing. Since this is an acute effect, it corresponds to short durations to higher concentrations. Effects then range to chronic effects, such as increased cardiorespiratory disease and morbidity. Notice that these effects begin to occur due to longer duration of exposure to smaller concentrations. Compared to what we saw for acute health effects. Finally, the beige area indicates concentration and exposure durations that can lead to increased risk of mortality. These are the high concentration parts of the plot. Short-term exposure to very high concentrations can cause instantaneous death, whereas longer exposure times to smaller concentrations, if high enough, can lead to a long-term premature risk of mortality. Explaining further by example, if a person or population were exposed to one part per million for 30 seconds, no adverse health effects would be expected. However, if the exposure to one part per million becomes longer, health effects begin to occur. A one hour exposure, for example, would lead to a risk of increasing incidence across the population of breathing populations and increased pulse rate. If the average exposure in one part per million increase to one month to a year, then excess mortality among the population may be expected. Likewise, going across the horizontal axis, a one hour exposure to 0.1 ppm would not be expected to lead to adverse health effects. However, if the, exposure, the concentration of exposure on a one hour basis increased, then health effects would begin to be anticipated. This emphasizes the general point from the last two slides, that acute health effects generally relate to short-term exposure to high concentration levels and long-term chronic effects to long-term exposure to lower concentration levels. A similar plot, organized a bit differently, is shown here for carbon monoxide. The horizontal axis is the duration of exposure ranging from minutes to several hours or days. The vertical axis 
is the percent carboxyhemoglobin in the blood, which builds up in the blood as exposure to carbon monoxide increases and causes health effects. The various health effects are color-coded, vertically up the plot from blue corresponding to no symptoms to red corresponding to coma and death. Concentration levels are indicated by the white lines going up the plot, ranging from 15 parts per million to 600 parts per million. Reading the plot, a 600 part per million exposure to carbon monoxide for only several minutes would not be, expect, be expected to yield symptoms. However, as duration of exposure increases, effects begin to occur from headaches and reduced mental activity for a 600 part per million exposure for an hour to the risk of death as the exposure to 600 parts per million covers several hours. Likewise, increasing effects occur as concentration levels increase for a fixed duration of exposure. A 10 hour exposure to 15 parts per million would not be expected to yield health effects. However, as the concentration level for the same exposure time increases, health effects begin to occur. As with SO2 from the previous slide, the same health effect can occur with a short-term exposure to high concentration or a long-term exposure to a lower concentration level. For example, headaches or reduced mental activity can occur with a one-hour exposure to 600 ppm or a 10-hour exposure to 100 ppm. Interestingly, with CO, after a certain duration of exposure, the percent carboxyhemoglobin in the blood does not change. In fact, each pollutant has its own unique version of this sort of plot. The short-term health effects on this plot apply very strongly to indoor air pollution, where carbon monoxide leaks from stoves, natural gas vents, fireplaces, and other combustion sources within houses and structures can cause buildup of CO to high concentration levels if not detected. Since carbon monoxide is odorless, indoor areas and residences should therefore be equipped with a smoke detector that also detects carbon monoxide.